Well, let's move on to our third and final article, and it is, quote, small but real progress carrying the yen carry trade into the light. So you posted this on September 25th at Alhambra Investments, and it's going to be a little bit of uh, euro dollar inside baseball, uh, but I don't want people to be too worried about it. It's, uh, it's revealing. You don't have to understand what cross-currency basis swaps are to get a sense of the complexity. And, and so let, let's just get started there. And um, let's see here. Let's see here. So writing in the 18th century, legendary English poet Alexander Pope penned an essay on criticism, which was published in 1711. This is an amazing piece of work, and it's three famous English aphorisms that came out of it. One, a little learning is a dangerous thing. I'm always worried about that one. Two, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I guess I should be worried about that too. And then three, to err is human, to forgive is divine. And that's where you start your piece. It's about an error made, two of them at least, by Bill Dudley. What were the errors? Who is Bill Dudley? Bill Dudley, if people should know, is was a, a very you know high level Federal Reserve official who happened to run some of the most important or be at the most important positions at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York during some of what are really the Fed's most important moments in history. You know, he was manager of the system open market account during the financial crisis, which I mean does not speak very well of the man. After failing at all of those things, uh, famously saying in August 7th, 2009, that nothing was imminent, especially in commercial paper, when two, two days later, the entire system froze, especially in commercial paper. Then, of course, the deal with IOER and getting that completely wrong in 2008. But, you know, one failure after another got Mr. Dudley promoted upstairs to the, to the position of president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York during the QE era. And during the QE era, he basically, you know, as we just talked about, we're printing all this money. Where are the results? And what he basically said in 2014 was, we're not really sure how this thing works. <laughs> Which is, I mean, that's not really how that what they, you know, the public persona they took for QE throughout its history. I mean, 2014, we're, we're almost six years into the QE era in the United States, and they still weren't quite sure if it worked, really, but how would it work if it did work? So um, already we're start. We're, again, our theme is, hey, we're, we might be missing something. We're, we're supposedly printing money, but we keep expecting the results of printing money, but never get them. So what are we missing? That's right. And Jeff's not exaggerating. Bill Dudley said that, and not just to his friends over a cognac, but uh, wait, I used the cognac line last week, over a sherry. No, he was. Th this was in a speech, a public speech, at the beginning of 2014. And I'm just going to read this out loud. This is by Bill Dudley. Quote, we don't understand fully how large-scale asset purchase programs work to ease financial market conditions. There's still a lot of debate. This is 2014. And don't forget, people, 2014 is 14 years after Japan implemented this the first time. Let me continue. There's still a lot of debate. Is it the effect of purchases on the portfolios of private investors? Or alternatively, is the major channel one of signaling? Jeff, those last two points, people might not know portfolio, you know, rebalancing and then signaling. Can you talk about that? Well, signaling is pretty straightforward. It, it, yeah. it's, it's basically expectations policy. And I think it's you know, when we call it signaling or we call it expectations policy, that might be a little bit confusing. But all it is is to the lay person, to the lay business person, you, you realize and you hear about on TV and the media that the central bank is doing something. You don't know what the something is and you don't really care. You're not supposed to care. All you're supposed to know is the central bank did something and therefore you act accordingly. So if the central bank says, I'm printing money, which they don't say, but we're buying assets, we're expanding our balance sheet, and you think that's printing money, you're going to act as if you believe inflation is a foregone conclusion, which is exactly what the signal is meant to signal to you, to act in an inflationary manner. The other channel, potential theoretical channel for quantitative easing, which quantitative easing, let's be clear, is, is, a, is, a, um, is a category of LSAP or large-scale asset purchase. So QE is a, is a sub, subset of LSAPs. So what it's supposed the other channel it's supposed to work through is um, what we call portfolio rebalancing, which is 
simply, in order to purchase securities, the Federal Reserve has to take them out of the hands of the banking system. So you were a bank, you had these securities, now the Federal Reserve do in response. And so what the, what the Fed would like you to do was, okay, we take some securities out of your hands, now go into the economy and lend and buy risky stuff and do all sorts of activities that are more akin to what happens in a recovery, what happens in a growth economy. So that's portfolio rebalancing. We remove securities from you, forcing you to do more risky stuff. So we've got signals, we've got portfolio rebalancing, and after five plus years of doing four QEs, they still didn't know which one was which, or if they really even worked that well. And Jeff, you take pains in this article to point out the unfortunate timing of some of these statements. So in August of August 7th, and then disaster was on August 9th, in October of 2008, how IOE, IOER was supposed to be a floor, but then turned out to be a ceiling. And then this speech was in January of 2014, which, as you talk about in the article, was just months before the third euro dollar crisis began to percolate. And so the first one, if people don't remember, the first one, the epicenter was the Atlantic Basin. And the and that was 2007 and 2008. And then the second euro dollar crisis was in the Mediterranean, percolating around there. That was the epicenter, uh, 2011, 2012. The third euro dollar crisis emanated out of the East China Sea. So tell people what started to happen in 2014, 15, and 16, what China and Japan have to do with the euro dollar system. Yeah, I'm going to go back and disagree with you there because the euro dollar number three, in my view, Emil, was already started when January, uh, in Janu early January, when when Dudley was making his speech. Because if if you look, if you, I mean, the U.S. Treasury yields began to fall as soon as the calendar turned 2014, as did the Chinese currency. So already, it's as soon as 2014 started. Remember, 2014 was supposed to be like 2017. That was supposed to be the big takeoff, the big celebration, the big we got it. This this the financial crisis is finally over. But right from the start, we already had these contrary signals that said, "Hey, something's missing again. You don't know how QE works, Bill Dudley." And now we have these contrary lack of liquidity signals in very important places, not just the U.S. Treasury market, but the Chinese yuan. Remember, Chinese yuan at that time, everybody said that thing, that sucker just goes up forever because China is invulnerable. It doesn't matter what happens to the U.S. It doesn't matter what happens to Europe. China will grow forever because, you know, we love the Chinese for some reason. Well, they I mean, did I don't before, know if it's Western you know? self-loathing or what. Well, it was 500 years ago. They were, you know, the epicenter of the world. And so we were just returning back to history. Yeah, and, I, and there's also the people who believe the Chinese are playing this this really long game, this patient long game, and you know our Western short attention span can't even conceive of how the Chinese are so far down the road. And so you know it, that was part of the the uh, the idea that CNY would only go up, and then all of a sudden it started to fall. So you had Treasury yields coming down, you had CNY falling. And what that said was that hey, there's something going on in the Asian part of the euro dollar system. This this hidden stuff we don't talk about. In the Asian part of the euro dollar system, when you start looking into the shadows, what you realize, as you pointed out, Emil, you know, the Atlantic Basin got euro dollar number one, Europeans in that area got euro dollar number two. And so in, as those things were happening over here in the Western part of the world, a lot of the dollar resources were moving toward China and Asia based on the idea that we just said, that China was, you know, genius, long game players who are invulnerable to anything. And all of a sudden, we had bad stuff happen in 2012, 2013, a lot of questions, especially in the summer of 2013. And by 2014, it was starting to become clear that all those dollars that had rushed in in the post-crisis era up to that point were starting to rush back out again. When we talk about rush back out, we're not talking about capital flows. We're talking about monetary destruction in the shadows. And of course, when you start to put all these things together, and who was at the epicenter of this Asian, Asianizing, if that's really a word, Asianizing of the euro dollar system up to that point, it was Tokyo, it was Japan. Jap Japan and Japanese banks have been, in the, have been the epicenter of this Asian influence since 2008. And there's data that we have that shows us, including the tick data that says Japanese banks really stepped up their game in the wake of the first global financial crisis, and their primary customers were the Chinese. So Tokyo was essentially the, 
the major redistribution point, a redistribution hub for euro dollars and dollar, you know, all these bank liabilities and denominated dollars heading toward China and other parts of Asia. And that's what you do in the article is you quote yourself from contemporary writing in 2014, 15, and 16, talking about what is happening there and what was called the yen carry trade. And you're bringing all of this up now, Jeff, because a week ago, the Wall Street Journal had an article talking about, hmm, the yen carry trade maybe is not as simple as we were led to believe, that maybe it's actually some sort of synthetic, complex dollar funding mechanism. And so, Jeff, I'm going to quote you, and I don't know if this is too in the weeds for, you know, for the show, but I would just quote it, and then you, you take it from there. Quote, the carry trade was never foreigners borrowing yen and then swapping into dollar assets. It was Japanese banks putting up yen reserves as an asset, as well as short-term Japanese government bonds as collateral against mostly basis and currency swaps in order to then redistribute dollars across Asia and, you know, what's coming, China. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's been a couple of years, but for a while there, the, the idea and the topic of, you know, people talk about the yen carry trade quite openly and quite frequently. It was a mainstream idea, mm-hmm. but to me, it was always wrong. It was, I think it was the mainstream trying to make sense of this thing without being, you know, without having the proper frame of reference to understand what that thing really was. And the yen carry trade in popular imagination was foreigners borrowing yen and then, you know, you know, taking advantage of interest rate differentials to make a profit, essentially basically recreating a synthetic bank. And that was always, that was, you know, it was kind of true. There was a kernel of truth to it, but they were missing the key part of it, which wasn't foreigners borrowing yen and then, you know, converting into dollars. It was Japanese banks who already had all the yen assets they would ever need because the Bank of Japan kept giving them the, (laughs) and the government of Japan, as we talked about in the previous segment, the government of Japan went nuts and created all sorts of JGBs so essentially, Japanese banks had all the yen collateral they could possibly want, but had no, no like everywhere else, had no interest of doing anything in Japan with those assets. And so they decided, why don't we get into the dollar redistribution business? China, China's invulnerable. China needs lots of dollars. They're doing lots of good things. The West is toast. You know, this is post-2008. The West is crap. You know, as El Arian said, this is a new normal for the West, but it's not a new normal for China. So, you know, we've got yen. We'll swap them into dollars. We'll use them as collateral and all these derivatives. And we'll, we'll lend the dollars into China because the Japanese banks had already existing and close relationships with Chinese banks and Chinese companies to begin with. And let's face it, Japan was moving quite a lot of production into China. So there was industrial connections there too. Tokyo made perfect sense to take over this redistribution function of dollars into China. And so that was the yen carry trade. It was Japanese banks redistributing using yen collateral and derivatives into dollars into China. So Tokyo, Euro dollar market, China all tied together in one, I don't want to say nice little package, but for a time it was. And then around 2014, it all started to go to hell. I wonder what the Ministry of Finance and the Bank of Japan thought of it all, because on the one hand, it sounds like the Bank of Japan was successful. They created reserves and the banks of Japan did something with it. That's what they've been trying to do for decades. But the problem was they did it overseas, not internally. So I wonder if that was bittersweet for them. I don't think it was bittersweet at all. I think they hated the idea because it's basically a slap in the face. It's like, hey, we want you to do something here locally to get us out of our problem. The Japanese banks say, no, nah, no, thanks. We're going to go, we're going to go foreign with it. I mean, it's, it's ba- we don't, we don't want anything to do with Japan. <laughs> it's, it's the worst possible statement. Jeff, just a moment ago, you said that it all started to go sideways in 2014, but now it's my turn to disagree with you. I would say that if you look at the tick data, which you mentioned earlier, the Japanese banks kept uh, borrowing dollars all throughout 2008, 2009, they didn't even blink. They didn't blink during the European sovereign debt crisis. And during 2014, they sort of paused that third euro dollar crisis. They they just stayed at that level where they were. But it was not until 2017, the autumn of 2017, that Tokyo decided, as you often write, 
we don't want to do this anymore. And as I've told you before, I point to Japan as the first domino of this fourth euro dollar crisis. Yeah, you know, we don't live in a linear world, as we always say, too. So even in 2014, if the, if the Chinese system and the rest of the Asian system needed you know, a high degree of growth of the redistribution of dollars into China and the rest of Asia from Japan, then even going sideways or even slightly positive is a contraction and it can be an enormous problem. But I think, you know, you know, the larger point is really that, look, this stuff is more complicated than you've ever believed. First of all, what we're all taught in school is that none of this stuff exists, that there are very small linkages between economies and monetary systems in particular, that, you know, each economy is essentially a closed system. And that's how DSGE models treat each one of these economies as if there's very small little linkages between them. And therefore, the Federal Reserve's mandate of only being a domestic banking authority makes sense, right? Because there aren't any dollars outside the U.S. that would make any difference for the Fed. And that's just wrong. And it gets, you know, what happened in 2008 was a global dollar shortage. Well, how can there be a global dollar shortage? Because there's this offshore, this vast, complex, offshore dollar system that exists and it's taken place right under everyone's nose for a very long time. And when you actually factor in that, you start to get, you know, go back to Ice Cube's money printing, right? Well, the Fed printed supposedly money, but it wasn't really money. They created lots of bank reserves. But what actually happened in the shadow system, this vast offshore monetary system, maybe that is our, the, the reason, or that's how we answer the inflation puzzle, that maybe the Fed did something positive, but this offshore system we don't pay attention to, we don't discuss, and we don't, we don't factor, took away more than the Fed might have ever added. So if you net it out, even if you consider bank reserves money, which I don't, even if you did, maybe there was more monetary destruction in Japan through China than the Fed ever had bothered to even think about. And that's when you start, the light bulb start, should start to go off. We start thinking, the answer to a lot of our problems aren't necessarily what's the right monetary system is, as we said in the first, we need to understand what the monetary system actually is right now. And so that, you know, the important point about the Wall Street Journal article a week ago was a sign of progress in that direction. Is that, oh my God, the mainstream is starting to realize that all the stuff they ignored before, you know, the yen carry trade made its appearance in the Wall Street Journal the wrong way many times and many years ago. Now they're starting to ask the right questions and think about the right things and realize that this is much more complicated than we ever thought it was. And that's a sign of progress. So forget, you know, the inside euro dollar, the inside baseball, that's, that's, that's interesting and that's important. But for people who don't really care about that stuff, it's an overt sign of progress that the mainstream is starting to move toward understanding the global monetary system, number one, global, and number two, it's far more complicated, textured, and nuanced than we've ever been to led to believe. And that's, that's, that's primary primarily the issue. That is a wonderful, hopeful way to end the show and enter the weekend, Jeff. So I'm going to bid you adieu, and thank you very much, and I'll talk to you again next week. All right, take care, Emil.